decisions today. And you don't have to pay. Expert panels with advanced degrees are sure to satisfy your curiosity. Did we mention it's free? And if you think you'll find a better time than this, then come on down and test your hypothesis. Cause you're gonna learn a lot if you wanna stay. Down at the Science Cafe. Welcome to Science Cafe New Hampshire in Nashua. My name is not Daryl Parker. Daryl is our panelist who's not here yet, so I figured I'd sit here <laughs> for a change. Um, I'm one of the organizers of Science Cafe. We've been doing this for over eight years. We've hosted probably mm, 90 sessions by now. We run another one up in Concord. So the idea of Science Cafe is just to give people information and let them learn and make their own decisions. And hopefully some of that ends up in the voter box, but that's individual decision. Uh, tonight, we're happy to have three panelists. One of them is late. Uh, <laughs> but we have Sam Fox from A&E Roastery, which is in Amherst and other places. And we have Brooks. I'm sorry, I can't get your last name. Um, Firth Bard. OK, yep. thank you. <laughs> and she's from uh, Mem Coffee, which is down in Boston. Coffee and tea, right? Uh, Mem tea. Just Mem tea. tea, no coffee. Only tea. Hold the coffee. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to ask them to give a, a three to five minute introduction of themselves and tell you a little bit about their background so you'll have an idea who they are. And then we'll throw it open to your questions. And hopefully, Daryl will show up sometime in the meantime. So Sam, would you like to start? Thanks for having me, everybody. My name is Samantha Fox. I am with A&D Coffee Roastery. And like you said, we are located mainly in Amherst is where our coffee roastery is. And we have a cafe there. So yeah, my three locations, we have the Amherst Coffee Roaster is there, and then we have a location on Elm Street in Manchester, and in Goffstown, located within Apotheca on the main street there. Um, I have been with A&D Coffee for only about six months. My background was in chocolate roasting um, and manufacturing, so it was kind of a little shift in gear for me to start working with coffee and tea, but as a self-professed chocolate nerd, I just fit right in with the coffee and now the tea nerds as well. So I've been learning a lot over the last six months, just some of the similarities in, in the production of chocolate to coffee to now tea, um, as well as some of the differences. So I've been very eagerly eating it all up. Hi, my name is Brooks Firthbard. Um, as we said before, I work with uh, Mem Tea, which is based in the Boston area. Um, I've been there for about six years. Prior to that, um, like a lot of tea people um, or people in coffee and tea, I worked in the coffee industry um, for many years. Um, and then I was before that I even worked in the wine industry and kind of all of these things, chocolate, coffee, tea, wine, they're all kind of knitted together. A lot of the um, science like we will talk about is kind of all related and knitted together. Um, Mem Tea itself has been around since 1999. So we are, as of this year, going to cel celebrate our 20th anniversary. Primarily we're, and still we are focused on wholesale, which means working with um, restaurants, cafes, hotels to kind of uh, see what they need and how they kind of provide for their customers, which is a really interesting uh, way to kind of look at the hospitality industry. Um, yeah, and tea is just a really exciting beverage. Um, that's why you guys are all here. They said it's a packed house, so um, I'm looking forward to all your questions. So I think we'll start first with um, our samples. Um, the first round of sampling I think that we're going to go around with, if we're ready, is a Gyokuro. Gyokuro is a Japanese green tea. Um, Japanese green tea is basically, well, and we'll get into kind of, I'm sure some of your questions will address like what is a green tea, what is a white tea, all of these things. Um, Japanese green teas in particular are steamed, which is um, different from Chinese green teas, which are actually heated to stop oxi oxidation. Um, so if you're kind of, if you ever kind of have a, you're doing a blind tasting and you don't know is this a Chinese or is this a Japanese uh, tea? It's actually, does this taste like steamed broccoli or does this taste like pan-fried broccoli? Is a really good way to uh, determine that for yourself. Gyokuro or um, some high-end senchas are actually, the reason why I brought this today for you guys is it goes through a really interesting process of shading. Um, they basically shade the leaves in the last two to three weeks of its growth period. Um, so I brought this for you because sometimes people will go their whole lives without tasting this process. Um, basically, it um, means that the UV light is, it's obviously, there's less UV light, which means that 
Um, it's, it slows down the photosynthesis um, that occurs in the leaf. So you get all these, like, you know, it's basically the leaf goes into distress. So all that chlorophyll kind of gets pushed up into the top of the leaf. Um, like a lot of uh, foods that we seem to like when organisms go into distress. Um, this is one of those. Mine's not about the tea we're drinking now, but it is about green tea. Oh, sorry, I'm where, where I'm are you? Here. Oh, hi. It's Sandy. Um, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about matcha, matcha, M-A-T-C-H-A? Is that a green tea? I see it in things that aren't always drunk. Yeah, so uh, matcha, it is a green tea. It's um, in the Japanese style, so it's, it's ground down into a powder, and then it's processed with the hot water. So it's, you know, you can probably touch on a little bit more, but it's, it's a very, it's an acquired taste for most people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a really grassy, earthy quality, and that's because it's, you know, kind of highly concentrated and, and processed really strongly that way. Yeah, it's in the, in kind of, matcha basically has entered Western tea drinking society fairly recently. However, it's been part of a Japanese tea ceremony for many, many, many years, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. We, um, and in the Japanese tea ceremony, it's very ritualized. You know, you have a bunch of bowls, and it's always done with hot water, as you say. Now we've, because we like the aspects of matcha, where instead of steeping it and getting some of the benefits of tea, where you're you're getting an extraction, you're actually consuming the entire leaf, which a lot of people really enjoy because again, you're getting all that caffeine and all of that theanine and all of those amino acids. So you're getting basically, it's like drinking five, six, seven cups of tea all at once. Um, for the same reason that we like espresso and we like four shots of espresso, we like matcha. So, um, so we found ways to make it more tolerable to the Western palate by doing matcha lattes and matcha Oreos and matcha, you know, whatever. So, Granola. yeah, and I, I love matcha lattes. So, um, yeah, that's another way to do it. And people have been experimenting with that. Yeah, we, we use a matcha. Some matchas you'll find, and if you go to certain cafes, they're pre-sweetened. So sometimes you'll go somewhere and you'll just get just a regular old, old matcha, mm -hmm. and, and their version of it is a pretty sweet drink. Um, but usually it's a very intense. If you're just doing matcha, like our matcha that we serve is unsweetened, so you're just getting the matcha. So if you're not used to that or if you don't yeah. like things that are just a real, real kick of grass in your mouth, um, <laughs> Some vanilla or honey is usually something to, to take off the bite of that a little bit, and that's yeah. I call that I secret sugar. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. So you talked about the uh, variations in steeping time for the different types of tea. What about um, optimal water temperature? Ooh, yeah. Um, Can you so on that? yeah, water temperature is pretty like that for the different categories. That's a pretty like locked system. Right, so um, for white tea, that's always pretty much going to be at 175. For oolongs, that's pretty much going to be right around like 185, 195, um, depending on the oolong and the shape. For black tea, that's pretty much always going to be at like 200, you know, to 205. Um, but again, you know, try you don't have to twist yourself in knots and always have to get a, a thermometer, you know, just. The more you make the tea, the more you kind of get to understand, you know, that, a, you know, this is at a rolling boil, this, you know, just when their tea kettle has like a little bit of bubbles, you understand that that's what that is at. Um, a lot goes to taste also. Exactly. Personal taste. Like we'll say your optimum temperature is like she was saying, the 175, I have 160 to 180 as our range there. Um, and for one to three minutes or whatever, you'll see certain certain guidelines set up like that. But a lot of it just comes to personal taste at the end of the day. So yeah, but like a Japanese green tea, like if it's over 175, you've just totally murdered it. Yeah. You know, yep. it's like yep. that's pretty that's pretty standard. Yep. Hi, I recently went to a Japanese restaurant up in Merrimack and asked for a, a pot of tea, and they said with or without rice. Um, we, we had it with rice. It was interesting and different. I, I've never heard that before. Mm -hmm. Is that a particular style? Genmai cha. Um, so genmai cha is like actually one of my most favorite teas um, on, on earth. It's fabulous. Um, it's basically just tea mixed with rice, popped rice. And it ha usually has like a roasty. They, they take the rice and they roast it or they toast it. Um, it's actually a tea that sort of was birthed out of um, scarcity. So, you know, they basically were, they didn't have enough tea, so they would mix it with rice to kind of stretch their, 
their the tea that they had because rice was at least around and tea wasn't um, and the taste is delicious again we talk about the prized flavors in Japan and umami is one of those and rice certainly has that and it mixes extremely well with this marine like quality that all Japanese tea seems to have because you're never that far from the ocean right um, so yeah it's delicious it's actually really good cold brewed as well so if you sit you know you put it in cold water, let it sit for about eight hours in your refrigerator, and then strain it. It makes this really delicious iced tea. If you want to add a little sake and shake it up, too, it's a really good cocktail. It's cold. Is that kind of like horchata? Hmm? Is that kind of like horchata? Um, doesn't have the same amount. It doesn't have the same uh, viscosity, mm -hmm. like, because it doesn't have, like, a milky right. quality. What are the symptoms of overcooked uh, tea or overprocessed? What does it specifically do to the flavor? Example, I had some sencha one time, which I know is described as being grassy. This particular batch I would describe as mulch. <laughs> um, it looked, smelled, and tasted like mowing the lawn. Mm. And so I just wonder if that is, they did something wrong or what? Could be a little bit of both. It could just be not good. Because um, sometimes the basically the, in Japan you're using all parts of the buffalo basically, so you're you know cutting all the way down, and the further down you go, the more you're getting into the the twigs of the tea itself, you know. So gyokuro, sencha, tencha, kukicha, hochicha, um, and you get the further down you go, the more you're going to get that grassy, twiggy kind of quality. And some people love it, and other people not so much. Um, it could also be old. The longer it sits, the more more moisture comes out of it. It starts to taste a little more like and have the texture of pine needles, you know, a little bit. And then also, again, it could have been just totally oversteeped. And again, if it's, you know, too much, if the water's too hot, again, it's you're really going to kill it. So it could be, it's a combination. Again, it's not, there's not a one size fits all of like what went wrong. It could be a lot of things. Um, and I think we're all, you know, many of us are, definitely stands to uh, or uh, have been guilty of letting a tea sit in our tea cabinet for too long and then we <laughs> pull it out and think it's going to be just as good. I just had a question. Um, if you're having tea in a tea bag, um, I always learned like twirl around the spoon and like, you know, drain it a little bit when you take it out. But then I've seen on some, some tea um, not to do that. Is there a recommendation there or like a reason why you would do one or the other? No, no, not really. No. Again, it comes to like she like she has said before. It, Sam said it's like it's a matter of preference, you know. Because again, it's like if you're draining it, you're going to get a lot of that like a, those um, flavonoids, like those extra tannins, you know. Um, and some people don't like that because again, it adds a little bit of bitterness uh, to your teacup. And I mean, I, that doesn't bother me a stitch. But for some people, that's not what they want. Um, yeah. So I think yeah, it depends. You'll, pretty much, you'll be extracting more of the flavor um, from it, and that's going to be the good flavors and maybe some of the undesirable as well. So you're going to be, you know, intensifying. So I, when I'm making, like, iced tea, I usually give it a squish because it's getting diluted anyway. So, But it's the same, same concept as, like, espresso, is that, like, you're going to be pulling a lot of flavors from it at one time. So you're going to be pulling some awesome flavors, and you're going to be pulling some, some less desirables as well. So... All right, so what's coming around right now is our Golden Buds Milk Oolong. Um, this is definitely a really intense, very interesting tea. The reason why I included this in the sampling, um, basically one, to give you guys a taste of an oolong, um, Basically, oolongs are really special um, in that they're bruised most of the time to kind of increase that um, enzymatic and polyphenol uh, interaction before they're oxidized. Um, that's really special um, and interesting. Um, oolongs are basically uh, that category of tea that's anywhere between about 10 to 70 percent oxidation. Um, when we talk about oxidation, we're also uh, it's another word for enzymatic browning which is kind of any time that the apple, an apple is, you know, exposed to open air or avocados get brown, bananas get brown. It's just, you know, most of the time in food science, they say enzymatic browning. With tea, we always talk about oxidation. They're the same thing. Um, oolongs are, they can be almost any shape. 
So they can be twisted, they can be rolled, like in hand rolling. Um, almost always, they're uh, typically very like hardy varietals. Again, because they have to withstand all of that, you know, bruising, and then they have to withstand the rolling and the twisting. And another really special thing is that they um, can be steeped over and over and over again, five, six, seven times. Um, a lot of people, especially in the West, we like to steep a tea and then pitch it in the trash. Um, and you know, that's definitely, I like to encourage people, please steep over and over and over again. Because the first steep, you get kind of one characteristic of a tea. The second steep, you get another. The third steep, another. Um, it, the, the tea shop that we were in, oftentimes we actually put our tea strainers in the refrigerator and pull them out and use them again the next day. Um, so that's something really important. The Golden Buds, uh, also we call it a milk oolong because it has that very interesting, strange aroma, and then you taste it, and it you know, has another kind of interesting taste to it. Um, my husband says it tastes like, it smells like Lucky Charms. <laughs> Um, and that has a couple things to it. It has a very um, particular kind of amino acid. Um, it's a very particular kind of varietal, and it also grows at a very particular elevation where mist kind of comes down from the mountain and it sort of settles onto um, this this tea. So again, it's not one thing that we can point to and say, why does this tea taste the way it does? Um, there's always a lot of things that go into it. Could you tell us a little bit about the processing of the tea leaf? I notice when I go to buy a whole, you know, a whole tea, sometimes it's a whole leaf, sometimes it's, you know, dust, sometimes uh, like the, I don't know how you say it, the pure, uh, how do you say the P-U-E-R-H? Pu'er. Thank you. Um, you know, that's pressed into a cup and looks like it's been left out to, you know, decay for a while. That's exactly it. Even though I love it, it's that's great it. tea. So can you, you know, what, what does the processing of the leaf due to the tea flavor and what should you look for, I guess, if you're looking for a certain type of tea? Well, the processing is kind of what she was talking about in terms of the your white teas, your green teas, your black teas. It's just all different types of processing after, after the manufacturing of the tea. Um, in terms of the shape of the tea itself, I don't know if there's you know, if you're talking about a whole leaf or a, a ground up tea, I think it's just different types of like your matchas, like a green tea that, that's a pout. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into it. So white tea is interesting. Um, when we talk about tea, a lot of times we're talking, especially in this context, we're talking about specialty tea, which has been handpicked. Um, and that only represents actually a really small fraction of the market. Um, so kind of leaving all machine processed teas aside, and we're talking just about hand-picked teas, um, white tea is basically any as a tea that it's been picked, and then it's just withered immediately. It's allowed to basically dry on its own, and kind of um, they dry it as quickly as possible. So a lot of times you'll see these big bamboo racks where they put the tea out and they let them dry as quickly as possible out in the sun. Um, a lot of times it's put these racks are kind of put on top of hot gravel to kind of allow this withering process to occur. Um, so the white tea is basically is the least processed form of tea. You're, you're getting basically the, um, it, it's as close to the leaf that you kind of would see on the plant itself. With green teas, um, what you're doing is you're picking the leaf, um, you're hand picking the leaf, and then you're basically trying to get the, to halt the oxidation process as quickly as possible. So you're trying to not let any oxidation occur whatsoever. There are many ways that this is done, but pr pretty much breaking it down, it's in China, it's pan fried or pan wok fired, uh, not pan fired, pan fired, um, where you're taking these big um, woks basically and kind of pressing it in in some cases to make these like flat shapes. Sometimes you're twisting it, sometimes you're kind of rolling it, but in many ways that's um, d down to tradition or whatever kind of flavor that you're trying to achieve. Um, and these are, it comes down to um, basically just. Uh, what the tea maker is going for, what they've always done, you know, um, what the tea in any particular year may require. Um, in Japan, it's always steamed. Um, and you can go for deep steaming, it can go for, you know, any kind of thing like that. Um, and then for oolongs, again, we're talking about 10 to 70 percent oxidation. So there's just this very wide variety of what an oolong would, would do. Um, and then what they do a lot of times is actually put the oolong teas in these big sacks, basically, and they kind of like machine roll them around, and that's how they bruise them. So they're kind of like, um, if I can 
they kind of like put them in a sack and they sort of like agitate them like this basically um and then that's how they sort of bruise them and then they're allowed to sort of oxidize again that enzymes and polyphenols kind of interact within the leaf um and then they're fired basically um and then black teas it's the same thing where they're basically um kind of twisted and withered they're allowed to wither a little bit and then they're fired so it's sort of like white teas where they're allowed to wither a little bit but then they're, they go ahead and fire them um and then puers are a whole separate thing puers are really interesting we're actually going to taste a puer um in a little bit i brought that again because it's a whole sometimes people will go their whole lives without tasting one and that's a tragedy um and that's when fermentation happens. And there are t actually two major types. Um, there's a shang puer, um, which is basically when they press them into bing chas, um, and allow, it, they allow natural uh, fermentation to occur over time. Um, it's basically when like bacteria and you know the natural environment occurs, you know, within this, you know, with on the, with this th the tea. Um, and then there are shoe puers where they basically are um, sort of creating um, the the shang process, but within a um, kind of an artificial environment. It's almost like a um, it's a pile fermentation. They basically put the tea into a pile, and then they sort of add moisture over time, um, and then they will put it either put it into a bing cha or then sell it loose. Hi, I have a question about um, freshness, if you could talk about it from farm to its travels here, and is it better if it's fresh? You just mentioned something about aged tea, and uh, could you comment uh, somewhat on that uh, time frame and, and optimum time in the journey? There's a good rule of thumb in that most teas are best consumed within a year, um, max. However, there are exceptions. Matcha is best consumed as soon as possible. Um, again, because you're, it's a, you know ground, it's losing moisture very quickly. Um, Darjeeling first flush is always best consumed within like three, three, four months. Um, that's because again, it's losing moisture very quickly. Um, Darjeeling first flushes are, Darjeeling in general is considered the champagne of teas. Um, that's kind of the <laughs> reference that a lot of people give to it. And again, it loses moisture very quickly. Um, and, um, but there are teas like the puers that are aged. Um, we actually recently had an aged white peony um, and you wouldn't necessarily think of white teas as something that you would age. However, over time, it actually got some really nice character through aging. So there are some teas where tea makers make the decision that maybe this would benefit from aging. Um, and it, it does. It actually sometimes gives it more character. Um, and then sometimes we accidentally age our own teas and they're either good or bad. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to take you back a little bit, and you were talking about um, amount of time to steep the teas, and you've talked about several different types, but uh, you haven't mentioned the times uh, and also the temperatures. Could you continue to, to do that while you're, when you're mentioning the individual teas? And uh, kind of a second question is, um, I notice most of restaurants don't um, talk about steep times or water temperatures and um, is there any any move forward to have restaurants do more of that uh, in keeping with the teas, uh, at, you know, from what we know in the U.S., which I've been to Japan, so I know they they have a whole bunch of uh, rituals, but uh, and we have some Chinese neighbors too that uh, love the tea too. So um, I, I come from and my wife's from Scotland, so she's also a tea drinker. So. <laughs> Thank now, you. Now you can go forth to those restaurants and say, hey, I know this is supposed to be three minutes. I don't know how long you've been sitting in this. So now you're armed with all this knowledge to go out and, uh, and demand better quality teas from your restaurants. Um, so the, as you were talking about the, the steep times on the green teas and the white teas, uh, she went into some of the different processing styles. So there are those five main processing styles that she was talking about. So for your white tea, where it's plucked and then withered and it's minimally processed, it's going to break down quicker, So which is why you want to use a lower temperature and a shorter steep time. So you want to keep it between the 160, 175, I think you said, um, and for only like one to three minutes. And again, that's going to depend on not only your taste, but the, the tea itself. 
Um, then you're going to move down to kind of the green tea, which is also going to be minimally processed, similar to the white. So that still has a, a relatively lower temp, but a little higher than the white tea, but it's still moderately lower temp because it breaks down faster because of how minimally processed it is. And uh, that's going to be a shorter steep time as well. And then your, your black tea, where she's talking about the, the oxidation and how it's bruised and the shell, cell structure is breaking down, that's a little bit more processed, so it can stand up to a little bit higher heat and a little bit longer of a steeping time. And that oxidation also has the most caffeine and the lowest antioxidant properties. Uh, the oolong is kind of in between the green and the black. Um, it's plucked and then it's withered and to reduce that moisture content and then bruised. Um, and then like a short oxidation, and that's going to be kind of in your, your middler range of the, you know, 190 to 200 and for like four to six minutes. And the pu'er <coughs> is the, the greener black and gradually fermented and composted with the microbials. It's got that deep earthy flavor. And it's got, again, more processing so it can hold up for, for a higher temp. Yeah, and a nice thing to know about pu'er, it's to your taste. Mm -hmm. um, but you, a lot of people, our recommendation is to rinse the pu'er. Um, with a little hot water, dump it, and then go ahead and add your hot water that you're actually going to, you know, then go ahead and make the tea. Um, not everybody, again, because especially with shoe puers where it's sitting in that pile of fermentation or, you know, with this where it's been, you know, sitting around in a bing cha for a while, um, not everyone likes that quality where it's kind of been just sitting around, maybe has some dust on it. Um, <laughs> so they want to rinse that off. Um, I like a little extra dust on my pu'er, but um, just dusty if we're talking about shoe. <laughs> if we're talking about brewing, yeah, you know, I like a little dusty shoe. Can you make some recommendations on iced tea, uh, specifically what variety of tea and how to how to uh, brew it? Uh, iced tea is uh, really fun to make. Basically, like we talked about the genmai cha and doing cold brew. Um, there are no rules regarding cold brew. The except for one, usually blends are a very bad idea because different things um, will extract at different rates. So like anything with orange peel, um, orange peel extracts actually pretty quickly in cold water. So it ends up tasting, always tasting just like orange peel. Um, so anything that's blended, usually not a good idea. But um, lots of green teas will taste really good, cold brewed. So pretty much anything, any tea uh, is a really good idea as far as cold brew. Um, black teas, oolongs, um, those are always a great idea. Um, herbals, I try to stay away from with cold brewing just because, again, they extract sometimes a very in a very strange way and it's hard to control. Um, but, yeah, other than that, I mean, you know, kind of the – the world is your oyster. As far as weights and things like that, um, it depends on kind of what you're trying to achieve. Um, I always, my, per, at home, I always do iced teas in um, one gallon amounts just because my husband is an iced tea fanatic. <laughs> so he can drink a gallon and easily like a few days. But um, yeah, and there are a lot of nice little, you know, um, devices for brewing iced tea. Um, I can definitely, if you're interested, I can give you a, a nice little list um, yeah, afterwards. When, yeah, when we're making iced teas, we have, you know, I think the most important thing that, again, it would have been my error six months ago was oversteeping. It's the same thing when you're doing your iced teas. You don't want to just leave that, uh, with the exception of, like, a cold brew or something mm -hmm. like that. But if you're making it hot to cool it down to make an iced tea, you want to make sure you're still timing it. We've got these little uh, cute little tea timer things that are the little sand last things mm -hmm. um so whatever if we're making an herbal we're setting the you know the five the seven minutes for our herbal if we're making a green we're making sure we're only doing it for you know the three four minutes for the green um, even though it's such a large quantity of it that we're making at once and we just use we don't use any fancy ingredients we use like the gallon you know jug and then we use the uh the loose tea bags that we have the little you know tea bags we do usually about one and a half ounces between three tea bags to maximize the surface area on that. Time in, throw them in, time it. I wonder if you could speak to the health characteristics to each um, major category of tea. This is complicated. <laughs> um, I would love to. Uh, so the FDA says that I cannot. We cannot because um, we can make no promises about you know any sort of product or health or anything. Um, however. Um, one thing that I'd like to tell anyone when we talk about the health benefits of tea is that 
we all like to think that when we, well, I'll, you know, I especially like to think if I go for a single run that I'm good for a year <laughs> or I'll have one pot of ginger. Today. Right? <laughs> yes. Or I'll have like a pot of ginger lemon and, you know, I'm never going to get sick again. Um, when Chinese herbalists um, prescribe tea to their to their patients, they almost always prescribe puer. They're almost always talking about puer, and that's for um, you know balancing your blood. It's for weight loss. It's for all sorts of things. So puer is one of those things where it's really good for your blood pressure. It's really good for your weight. You know your weight. It's really good for your mood. Um, so puer is one of those things that for sure we know is like there's a lot of health benefits there, um, but they're talking about five, six cups a day. Like, absolutely. So when you say, like, when we look at this, you know, is this good for you? You need to be drinking, like, a tea in the morning, a tea at, you know, in the mid-morning, a tea in the afternoon. Um, tea is not one of those things. If you're looking for the health benefits of tea, it needs to be, it's not, like, an idle thing. However, if you're drinking a, a cup of green tea and you're, have never had green tea in your life you're one cup of green tea ahead of where you were yesterday one is i heard that um the difference between caffeine in coffee and caffeine in, in tea is that uh coffee is a kick all at once and tea caffeine is time released is that true and secondly um if i want to make a transition to drink more tea and not coffee are you saying that you could treat cold brew or, or sun brew if you want the least care tea of all these, where you don't have to worry about time, you said you could repeat steeping endlessly for um, oolong. Is that true for the others? So that's true for like black tea. You probably get two steeps out of a black tea. Green tea, you probably get three, four, maybe five. Um, oolongs, you know, three, four, five, six. You know, pretty much until it, you'll know when it's done. Um, Puer, same thing. You'll get three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and then herbals, that's the one where it's like, it's again, one, two, maybe. Um, and yeah, I mean, just you're, you pretty much want to steep a tea until you can, it's, it doesn't have the desired flavor anymore. Again, it's your taste buds, it's your preference. So caffeine is more of a, the ca caffeine that's in coffee, it's more of a um, exciter. Basically, it's it's uh, something that basically um, is just a straight exciter, whereas with tea, it's more of a what you would call like a um, gives you more focus. And that comes down to theanine, um, where that's the primary um, uh, component. And that gives you just mental focus, gives you more clarity. And that lasts a little a lot longer than the caffeine um, in coffee would, where that just pretty much gives you that you know, bang on eyes open, you know, feel. Uh, I have a friend in tea that, or that's in tea that actually calls coffee the devil juice. Um, if you're trying to transition um, from, co you know, being a coffee drinker, um, a lot of people, especially if they're in New, you know, New England, they're drinking a lot of iced coffee. Um, so just, you know, switching to iced tea is a really good idea. Um, if you're more of the hot coffee drinker, um, then yeah, an oolong is a really good idea. Um, cause it kind of, it has that like same viscosity that a coffee would. Um, it's, you think you, a lot of times you think like an English breakfast or an Earl Grey fills that void, but it's not as viscous. Um, I can tell you as a former coffee drinker, like I drink coffee all the time, like four or five cups a day. Oolong was a much easier and better transition for me. Um, I have a question about um, allergies, since if food and beverages often are things we talk about with that, and am I the only person in the world who has some reaction and gets a stomach ache from chamomile, which you hear the opposite? No. I do have family members with food allergies like allium, garlic, but I don't, so I'm just wondering about that topic. No, uh, we have people actually we, that work for us. That we have one person that works for us that actually has a chamomile allergy. They can't pack the, they can't pack anything that has chamomile in it. Um, yeah, so we we have a person who packs our tea that can't pack the chamomile, um, and we you know we just have to be sensitive to that. Um, I actually have a there's a tea that, um, yeah, I mean especially when you get into herbals, um, just to address 
herbals, we technically, we call them herbal teas uh, here in the West, um, but they're not technically tea. Um, a lot, uh, if you're in Europe, they call them tisanes. Um, sometimes they're called infusions. Um, but anytime you're, uh, any tea would technically just be the Camellia sinensis plant. Um, but anything kind of outside of that is some, is something other than that. And chamomile, um, while it's a very popular tisane or infusion, um, yeah, it's not technically tea, but once you start talking about herbals, you're talking about all sorts of plants and all sorts of species and all sorts of varietals. And it's, you know, you can be allergic to that just as easily as you can be allergic to anything, you know, latex, you know, it's, it's a, it's a organism, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Sometimes it could also be the acidity too. There are certain, even just coffees, if they have a higher acidity content, you know, they can be a little bit more upsetting to some people. So it could be something like that too. What about sweet, sweetening it and flavoring it? Do you have any comments like types of sugars, the some of the non-sugars, I guess, the stevias and those type of things, and what kind of experiences do you guys have with those? In general, um, our relationship, like the Western relationship with sugars and non-sugars and all sorts of things is really complicated, right? So like we have added sugar we've added honey we've added agave we add all sorts of kind of things to our tea to you know sweeten it flavor it do whatever to it um you know we convince ourselves that honey is somehow you know not bad for us because it's you know honey or whatever you know it's better than you know it's because it's not i don't know it's not sugar that it's good for us i don't know um and with stevia you know it's got a very complicated thing because the fda has is maybe thinking about getting rid of it or something like in plant variety there's rumors about that um we have it in some of our iced tea blends actually like the raw plant variety it's about 100 times sweeter than sugar um so we have in a, in a couple of our herbal teas we've included it and it's really effective um in sweetening um but a lot of times when people think about stevia they think of it in this raw or in that like powder form like the little packets um but we have it in just like the plant form just all cut up so a lot of times when i do trainings i have people like pick it out and actually like put it on their tongue these like tiny minuscule little you know we're we are always concerned about you know anytime anything is kind of replace sugar you know um it seems to find its way on the on the fda chopping block so that's uh that's a potential um so we're you know we're looking into other options none of our teas have sugar in them but we have all sorts of sugars honeys alternate sugars stevias um things just available for people to add if that's what they choose to do yeah, again, it's personal preference. Yeah. It's whatever you want to do to your tea to make it taste the way that you like. You know, we're not going to get in the way of that. Mm -hmm. But there are some kinds that are just naturally sweeter. If you get like a first flush, you know, the, the pulled earlier tea leaves, it's, you know, tend to be a little sweeter too. So if you're trying to stay away from sweetness, there are di different recommendations that people can make that would um, cinnamon, satisfy that. Cinnamon, licorice, yeah. those are all things that you find in teas a lot of times that make te teas taste naturally sweeter. Cinnamon is a really popular one, especially if you're using like high quality Vietnamese cinnamon, it will take a, it will make a tea taste much sweeter. And then licorice root makes a tea taste like overwhelmingly sweet. Um, all the teas coming, you know, the teas coming from like China, Japan, India, places like that. Uh, two parts. Uh, one, what do you guys do for quality control as far as the uh, tea coming in? And two, if you're getting your tea out to the end user through a middle person who's serving your tea, what do you do to ensure that the quality, because you said you can demand good quality tea, but if the average person doesn't know that and they steep it for 10 minutes, and all of a sudden like, oh my God, mem tea, this is so bitter. What do you do to ensure that that middle business aspect is uh, doing the right thing with tea? We have a couple things that we do. So as far as quality control, um, we do something called Tuesday night tastings, which has gone back to the beginning of the business. Um, we basically meet every week, uh, and that that's where kind of where we make our purchases. We review any kind of ingredients or any blends that we might have had any problems with or concerns. Um, but basically, we taste every aspect of kind of the things that we need to review. So if we're looking at samples of 
Sencha's because we're looking to purchase a new Sencha and then we'll sit there and we'll taste 10 Sencha's and then we also need to look at cinnamon so we'll taste you know 15 different cinnamons um so I think at yesterday's uh tasting we probably made decisions for about oh, I want to say 11 different ingredients or teas and then we'll do it all again next week um so for say like a chai which has about seven or eight different ingredients anytime any of those ingredients need to be adjusted or the recipes need to be adjusted you know we have to look at the cinnamon we have to look at the ginger we have to look at the cloves we have to look at the allspice and all of those ingredients need to be rebalanced um so it's a lot of work um but it's good it's good work and that's why we do it um and there's usually um it's the those tastings are open to anyone who works there so if you work in the packing room or you work in the office or you work anywhere we're pretty much just we want people's palates um so you know we there's you know the people who work there is the education director we have you know obviously the you know the founder we have the owner we have you know people who've been there for a long time who have the experience to make and who are making the purchasing decisions but it's also open to anyone in the company who wants to just give feedback and say i like this i don't like this um, because pretty much anyone's palate is useful. So, and then as far as, you know, working through wholesale and using those, making those decisions, we, um, any of our wholesale customers actually are entitled to staff trainings at any point and they're free. Um, so we do a lot of staff training, um, to make sure that, uh, people are comfortable as far as presenting the tea, um, you know, talking to the customers, customers about the tea, understanding the tea. Um, we do reviews with managers to make sure that they kind of, you know, understand, yeah, you know, this tea is doing well, this tea is not doing very well. Um, a lot of times if a tea is not doing very well, there's a reason behind it, you know, like this tea hasn't sold a single pound in a year. Um, and it's usually cause it's not being served properly or, you know, there's something behind it. So we have to kind of look into those things. Um, but yeah, staff trainings have been a huge part of it. We actually just built an education center in um, Somerville. Uh, that was about two years ago. Um, that's been a big step for us as far as our wholesale business. So not only do we come come here and do staff trainings, but we also have been able to invite people to our training center and they can come and you know sit and do classes. Um, that training center also does public public classes as well too which has been a huge uh, interesting part of our business we're really excited to kind of meet the people who enjoy our tea yeah we as a coffee roaster we have kind of a very similar process for the coffee we a couple times a week we're doing a whole table of cupping so we don't we we work with wholesale companies you know just from the retail side of it um, for tea we work with the wholesale companies that we have really good relationships with and we'll be on the phone with them a couple times a week they'll send us samples um mm -hmm. we we will just test through and it's just it's just about forming relationships with companies that have similar business values as you and, and similar types of quality control hi this question's mostly for sam with your chocolate background so i've seen and i've had some teas with chocolate and white chocolate in it i haven't been a fan so i'm wondering if is that a fad or is there some historical relevance to putting it in there? Um, it's a little bit of a battle with my son who likes it and I don't. There's definitely, it started out as a drinking. It started, the history of the chocolate was it started out as a, a drinking, you know, chocolate. Uh, so it was made as a beverage and it started out kind of in the similar vein as the, the coffee and the tea where it was a, a stimulant that people would use. They would drink this and they would feel excited and, and ready to take on the day. Um, so it does start, it does have a lot of history there. And, you know, you'll still see a lot of places that do the drinking chocolate and you can actually even make a tea from the um, the husk of a cocoa bean um, after it's been roasted and, and winnowed, which makes a, a pretty great smelling little beverage there. It's mild, but, you know, it's rather than putting a whole chunk of chocolate in tea. And again, it's just a, a taste thing, but there is definitely a, a history of that being a stimulant drink. Um, I'm going British, and I have, I've always heard the concept that do you add the milk first or the milk after you steep your tea. Um, I don't know if you any, have any comments on that after. and what's the proper way. I don't know about the British, but, you know, the science is after because the, your milk's going to cool it down. So if you ideally you're having 175 degree on your white tea and you add some 37 degree milk to it, you're, you're affecting the temperature and you're not going to be pulling the right flavors and, and steeping appropriately for the right amount of time. So if you wait the three minutes 
and then you add it, then you're not concerned about hitting that that sciency bit of maintaining this temperature for that steep time. Okay. So, I mean, if you can add it first if you want to, but you're you're not going to be steeping it as as long. Very interesting. I kind of like tea, but I realize I'm a total rookie here. <laughs> I'm um, gonna try to drink more tea too after tonight. But how would Six you, cups a day. Um, like, store it? What, like in an air tight container, or could you just leave it in the shelf? Or <laughs> does it matter? Or does it matter on the different teas that you store it differently? Just dry, cool area. You know, d um, and it, like you would store pretty much any food. Just don't stick it on top of your oven. Keep it, you know, in an airtight container, and make sure it doesn't get wet, like a gremlin. Yeah, you want to keep that moisture from coming off too fast and that, that gassing off process of trying to control as many variables that are affecting the tea as you can, but within yeah. reason. A lot of the need a padded room. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the teas that uh, you get from like the grocery store or whatever, if it doesn't come in a Ziploc bag, just toss it in a Ziploc bag or something. If it doesn't have like a zipper, but other than that, you're good. Um, my question was related to um, this lady, which she talked about uh, British tea. I grew up drinking tea. Um, I'm from Pakistan, and uh, my father w was from India. <laughs> and uh, the tea that I saw being prepared every day, a couple of times uh, in my household, was black tea. And my mother was very particular about um, keeping the two um, um, uh, pans or pots, I would say, separate for uh, the brewing of tea and the milk. Um, and the milk had to be at a certain temperature. And uh, now the tea has really picked up in US. And um, I remember when I came here um, a couple of years ago, I went to a tea place and I asked for a British tea, a British tea black tea. Um, and I was served the black tea, just like a black tea brewed cup of tea. And I asked uh, for milk. And they brought me those tiny, small cups. Um, so, and, and, I, and then I asked, I said, can I have the, tea, the milk warmed up? And the, the people were almost like offended by it. Um, so I had to explain to them, I said, this is how the tea was prepared in my household. And there, was, there has to be a particular time that you have to, to, to steep the tea, the black tea. And then you have to add warm milk to it, not cold milk, because you are stopping um, the oxidation process, the brewing or the, the, the taste development of the tea. So yeah, I mean, I just want, I was wondering, and I was listening to all the, this conversation. Um, so when you serve tea, do you serve milk at uh, in the the room temperature, or you warm up the milk for uh, for um, uh, black teas? Yeah, I'd say at this point, find a new tea shop. <laughs> sure. Oh, I I moved. Yeah. I that was in <laughs> that was in New Jersey, yeah. and I make my own tea now. So solid, solid. yeah, um, I would say we. We do a lot of tea olays, and that's you know kind of steaming. If, if people like tea with milk, I would recommend a tea ole, and we can kind of do that. It's basically just it's steamed milk, so that the milk is brought up to a nice temperature where you're still having your nice warm drink, and you can have as much milk as you want, and you want have have it as creamy as you want without making it a, a room temperature blah drink. So there are definitely ways to be able to add milk to your your beverages and not not cool it down. That said, there's some people that ask me to throw four ice cubes in their hot tea so that it's the right drinking temperature. So, you know, it's, it's, it's again, it's a, it's a personal, personal preference thing, but yeah. yeah, you should be able to get, you know, tea at the, the temperature that you want to drink it at, regardless <laughs> of what you're putting in it. Can you speak to the psychology of tea versus the psychology of coffee? Or could you recommend somebody who writes beautifully about that, about tea? Um, so if you are interested in reading a little bit more about tea um, and kind of kind of what goes into it, I have uh, if you're talking specifically about like the psychology and you want to get a little bit more information, um, I actually recommend we're talking about psychology and not just more textbook. Um, this book actually just recently came out um, and I think it's actually fabulous um, as far as it's called um, a little tea book. Uh, it's Sebastian Beckwith uh, is the author. And if you're talking about just the psychology and you want to dip just a little bit into the world of tea and get a little bit more knowledge, it's um, the prose is, is very easy and well-written. It talks, this is actually the guy that talks about devil juice. 
<laughs> my friend that talks a little bit about coffee being double juice. Um, it's just a very easygoing, well-written book. Um, and it talks a little bit kind of the psychology of tea and tea drinkers and a little, you know, just a, it's a little bit about everything. It talks a little bit about labeling, a little bit about processing, a little bit about whatever, you know, so that's kind of what the title comes from, a little tea book. Um, so that's, it's, that's kind of why I recommend it. I have another book. If anyone's looking for something that's a little more encyclopedic, um, if you want that, you can come up later and I'll give it to you. Hi, I was wondering if teas, the same type of tea, like a green tea or a white tea tastes the same if they're coming from different countries or if there are differences in what they taste like from different countries. No two batches of even the same tea from the same co same location made by the same people are ever going to even taste the same. You know, there's so many variables that go into, you know, environmental factors, uh, elevation, the way the time that they're they're harvested, the time that they're plucked, um, the way they're processed while they're there, the way they're processed by the the tea manufacturers, and the way they're stored along the way. So, um, I don't know if you have something to add to that, but yeah, no, it's you can get the exact same. This is where I got it from last time, two weeks ago, and it still tastes different. I mean, you might not everybody would have the palate that would, I probably wouldn't notice that, but mm -hmm. she might. But yeah, I mean, like when we talk about the the Tuesday night tastings, where we're talking, you know, we have to compare this sencha against this sencha against this. You know, that's what we're tasting for. Do we like this sencha yame versus this sencha yame versus this fukumushi versus this? You know, um, that's what we're doing when we're doing those tastings. Um, you know, but. Uh, I guess more to the point when we talked about the like the gyokuro when we tasted this, you know, we're you know I'm saying when you do a blind tasting when you're sitting the next time you have a green tea and you're blind tasting it if you don't know what if it's from China or Japan play that game with yourself and try and find out does this taste like steamed broccoli does this taste like pan fried broccoli. Um, and if it tastes like pan fried broccoli, it's probably from China. If it tastes like steamed broccoli, it's probably from Japan. You know, um, and then that processing again of stopping that oxidation, you know, where you're halting the oxidation by using that wok firing in China, or you're stopping the oxidation by using steamed firing or by steaming in Japan. That's just kind of one example of how that processing can make a big difference in the way that you're tasting it. Yeah, you guys talked about whoa uh, caffeine earlier. Can you talk about yerba mate for a little bit? this question every time <laughs> uh yeah so mate was like a thing um so in and it's so basically mate is um a tea that is hails from um south america and typically it's traditionally drunk uh, in a gourd that hangs around your neck um and then it has a special little straw that has a little filter in it um and it basically just kind of sits the mate kind of sits in there, um, and it you basically keep filling it up with water, you know, all day, and you just keep drinking out of the gourd. Um, and it's often sometimes considered a social activity, so you can like share it with others, and then drink it and share it with others and drink it and um and mate again you know thinking about it as another where we talk about caffeine and versus theanine and those alkaloids and how it's a little different and you know whether coffee is better than the caffeine the caffeine and coffee whether that's um more of a stimulant more of a like you know, keeps you wide awake than the um kind of the the theanine that makes you more focused in tea um they call the caffeine that's in ma in mate, they call it matine. So it's a different alkaloid. Instead of that sharp tick that you get from coffee, it's supposed, supposed to give you more of that like mellow up and then mellow down. Um, and again, it has this very like wheaty, grassy kind of taste. Um, and it was very popular probably like f five, six, to seven years ago, it had kind of a popularity kick. It's enjoying kind of the same kick that matcha is now. Um, it was very trendy. Um, we uh, had it, you know, we had it loose. We had it in lattes, kind of like you're seeing with matcha. Um, it's always hard to tell whether these trends persist. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's enjoyable. Question over here. Hi, it, it sounds like high quality tea growth is similar to um, uh, growing of, of grapes for, for wine, it's really dependent on the environment, the, the hill structure, quality of land. Uh, I was wondering, are any tea manufacturers seeing any changes as a result of climate change? Absolutely, yeah. So 
Um, it's definitely happening. You know, we certain teas are only grown at certain elevations. You know, certain um, moisture levels are certainly required. Um, you know, you were obviously seeing like uh, if we had big and geopolitics also plays into it like you know we're basically in Darjeeling there was a lot of conflict going on and some of that uh, climate change is bringing on those geopolitical conflicts you know so uh, right now that's kind of a harbinger as well of like you know, we're not getting any many Darjeelings because they're having different conflicts that are brought on by food shortages or certain things. So that's another problem as well. Oddly enough, there are some teas that actually ben are benefiting from climate change a little bit. Um, not to be like the strange person in the room, but there are um, certain bugs that because of climate change, they're actually there are be, there are more of these bugs like they're called leaf hoppers um, that are especially prevalent in Taiwan um, and they bite the leaves and because the leaf is being bitten um, those defense chemicals in the leaf they actually come out um, and they actually make the leaf um, more delicious when you taste it they get have it um, they bring on a more honeyed character to the leaf itself um, so that's a kind of a bizarre effect of uh, climate change but other than that no it's completely devastating to the tea industry um, uh, and then on the other side again thinking about geopolitics uh, and the effect that that's going to have is truly terrifying so the first thing is you mentioned flush and I, I know what it means but just to make sure everyone else understands what it means can you talk about flush as well as what it means to quality and what it means to price kind of of tea um, then the second thing if you don't mind talking about tea bags I think a lot of people have bad perceptions of they go to the store, they get a tea bag, and they don't understand they're getting a lot of stems and, and bad tea if they don't buy a really good quality tea. So you can talk about those two things. I think it would help everyone here understand more about tea. Um, so flushes basically are just, it just means pickings or harvest. So like a first flush just means the first picking. Um, it just, when we talk about a Darjeeling first flush, it just means that it's being picked in the spring. Um, and then a second flush is essentially that it's being picked in the um, summer. And then you have a Darjeeling um, autumnal flush essentially. Um, and then that each of these flushes they have their own characteristics. So a first flush would be the most prized. Um, it's usually the most expensive. Um, and typically Darjeeling's, the first flushes always are put into a black tea category. Characteristics, the characteristics are not necessarily, when you actually taste it, when you look at it though, it doesn't really look like black tea. Um, it's very light in color. It's very um, light in taste. It's not necessarily fully oxidized like a black tea would be. Um, and then, but the second flush and the autumnals, those are most certainly black teas. Um, usually second flushes have more of a muscatel flavor, almost like a um, Chardonnay or something like that. And then the autumnals are much more uh, rich and taste much more like a, a black tea would. If you are, that's kind of the, the theory behind buying loose leaf tea versus just a, a pre-packed bag because you're going to be able to see all the contents that's that's in there and know, you know that you're getting a, a consistent and you're getting leaves not not branches and twigs and so i think it makes a it can make a huge difference on on every single cup that you're not to mention just budget wise you know you're not paying for twigs and things you could just grab outside for yourself um so if you go somewhere that you can buy the loose leaf tea and see what you're getting see that see the you know undesirables that you're not getting um it can make a, a big impact on the the quality of the, the cups that you're going to be able to brew yep. and there are certain companies that um, like Mem, we actually uh, do only use the, the tea that we have loose leaf uh, is the tea that we do put into our tea bags. Um, that is a rarity. Most tea companies actually put different tea into their tea bags than they would sell you loose leaf. Um, so a lot of times it actually just pays off to buy the loose leaf and then just bag it yourself um, in a filter um, because you just really never know. And you'll save yourself some money too. Did I hear correctly that it takes 40 years to cultivate a tea plant? Before it actually starts producing um, tea that you could you could consider specialty tea and ready to drink, yes. They, usually they're only grown to like waist height, but they have to be fully mature in order to to make a, a, a plant that you can you know dr actually drink. So anyway, I have three things for you. The first is join me in thanking our panelists. They were excellent. <laughs> Please come and join us. Again, it's a free science cafe on February 13th. Thanks for coming tonight, and it's glad to see you all.